Um, morning everyone, my name is Simon Garrett, I'm Head of Conservation and Learning at Bristol Zoological Society, so welcome, this is where I live. Um, I've been here, living here for quite a long time as well, I've worked here for 28 years, so if there's anything you want to know about this organisation, what it's been doing over the time, where we're headed in the future, um, talk to me or any of the other staff here, um, feel free. Other staff, there's a few kind of in the back as well, they're kind of around and helping. Just look for Bristol Zoo badges, um, if you want to ask them and talk to them about anything, just please feel free. Um, something before I forget, I need to say at the beginning of this session, this session is kindly sponsored by the Economic and Social Research Council. Thank you very much to them. Okay, this is a new format to communicate. I don't know how it's going to go, but we'll <laughs> it's up to me and you to make this work. Um, and here is my script, don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared. Because I haven't read it yet. Um, there's some amazing behind the work scenes, I'll explain this in a minute. Some behind the scenes work that's gone on uh, to prepare this. It should all work. Thanks very much to Matt who's put this together and to Jeremy who's put all the clips together because this is gonna, what we're going to do, okay? Um, so, Communicate's been going for 15 years. This is the 15th Communicate. Yay! Um, I think I'm the only person now, because Jane missed last year. There's two of us, now it's only me, that have been to every single one of them. Um, so, uh, often it communicates, we've got lots of new people, as well as people who've been here for at least some of them before. Um, and sometimes we go, oh yeah, we discussed that previously. So what we're going to try and do is go through the last 15 years of communicate, but put that in the context of what's been going on in the world, because 15 years, an awful lot has changed. So there's been new opportunities that have opened up for us, new challenges, new things that have been talked about, all sorts of things. So we're going to go through what the world was like each year, what was going on to communicate each year, so we're going to spend three minutes on each year, that will take us to about halfway through this session, okay? Then it's over to you, but actually the first bit is also you working as well, because as we go through, what I want you to start doing is jotting down, either on bits of paper you've got in your notebooks or on the bits of paper that are on the table, Things that you think are really important, that have caught your imagination, things we need to bear in mind, things that we learn to communicate, we think, oh, yeah, of course, that's the kind of thing we should do, or that's the kind of thing we shouldn't do. Or examples of something that, you know, we show and talk about here, and go, oh, I know a time when that worked really well, or, no, that's completely wrong, because I've seen it work three times, you know, tried three times and it failed every time, or something. So this is basically three quarters of an hour of sharing 15 years of the world with you when you're jotting down things that you think are salient. The second half will be trying in your tables to distill that into three key takeaway messages. Great. What we're then going to do with those is collect them up and cluster them. And I'm sure we won't all come up with the same three, okay? We'll cluster them and who knows, we might end up with five or 17 and we're going to put those up on some boards and they're going to stay there for the rest of the conference. So that as you go through the conference, you go, oh, actually, I'm not so sure about that one anymore. So we'll kind of end up with a kind of conference-generated mind map of the most important things that we've learned from the last 15 years of the world and communicate. And what we're going to do with it for the next 15 years, so when we do the same exercise in 15 years' time for the 30 years communicate, we'll go, do you know what, all that amazing stuff we learned, we put it into practice and now the world is like this, okay? Because it's up to us to create that future. I wasn't going to do this, but I will, see if I can remember it, it's just come into my mind. There's a, a quote from the Oscar, it was used on the front of the documents on the Australian Commission for the Future, but it's actually from a, an American economist. Let's see if I can remember it. And anyone else can chime in if they know it. The future is not some place we are going, but somewhere we are creating. Paths to the future are not found but made, and the making of those paths changes both the creator and the destination. I think that's about right. Look it up and see how close we got. Okay? The important thing is we're not stumbling into the future. We are creating it. What kind of future do we want? That's why we titled this conference The Art of the Possible. Taking what we've got at the moment, all the challenges, all the change that's going on at the moment, taking that opportunity when things are in flux to go, right, what are we going to do? to create the right future that we can reflect back on in 15 years' time and go, we did that through all of our work and our communications, okay? So, no pressure. So, you're okay with that? 
So the first half, me spouting, and hopefully, Jeremy, thank you so much for putting all the videos together. Hopefully this is going to work. Um, so while this is going on, don't just watch and listen, but think, write down your thoughts, jot them, because then afterwards we'll be discussing and we'll distill the best ideas from this room full of amazing brains, okay? So I think I've said all the bits I need to say. Let's start there in 2004. Um, world population 2004. Okay, oh, the other thing I should say is most of this off is off Wikipedia. Okay? <laughs> Intentionally so, because some studies have shown that Wikipedia is actually more, contains less errors than some of the big published encyclopedias, so don't diss Wikipedia. Also, it's a great way of crowdsourcing what people thought was important in the world at that time. Hence, thank you, Matt, spending your time looking on Wikipedia for the last few days. So, World population at 6.4 billion, 48% of people living in cities. Tony Blair was Prime Minister of a Labour majority government and George W. Bush was in the White House. Uh, UKIP surge in EU elections going from 3 to 12 MEPs, countryside code was published and the right to roam came into effect. This is also for those of you who are older in the audience to kind of go, oh, I remember that, and for those who weren't born at the time to go, oh, okay, didn't know that. Um, the government announced its plans to prohibit smoking in most enclosed public spaces. That was 2004. Parliament passed the Hunting Act, banning fox hunting in England and Wales. And most importantly, the first airing of X Factor, Strictly Come Dancing and Peppa Pig. <laughs> <laughs> um, communicate actually didn't have a title. It was, we just invented it and got it together, and it was just communicate. Um, and there was talk about that, I remember a discussion at the first Communicate um, where Keith Scully was kind of battered a bit by the audience, basically saying, you, BBC, why aren't you more campaigning? And he went, I can't. Um, and look what's changed since then, things like um, state of the earth, sorry, state of the planet and things like that, and saving planet earth, came out of some of those discussions at Communicate. So communicating the discussions and the battering that Paul Keith got at that first Communicate actually changed some of the things the BBC did. Okay, 2005, we haven't got a clip to show you from that one, but we will with the next one. 2005 now, the Kyoto Protocol officially goes into effect. Pope John Paul II dies, and over 4 million people travel to the Vatican to mourn him. Charles, Prince of Wales, marries Camilla Parker Bowles. Live Aid, a set of 10 simultaneous concerts, takes place throughout the world, raising interest in the Make Poverty History campaign. That was something which I think comes further down, Matt's going to nod. Make Poverty History. Did we pick that one out? Is it? Yes, we did, so that's going to come out later on. An interesting talk about why they didn't work. Ooh, Make Poverty History didn't work. Uh, four coordinated suicide bombings hit central London, killing 52 people and injuring 700. Hurricane Katrina makes landfall in the US, causing severe damage and killing over 1,000 people and dealing, uh, dealing estimated 108 billion in damage. UN Climate Change Conference held in Montreal. The first airing of Deal or No Deal. You see all the best bits going to be in. Come dine with me, Love Island, Jeremy Kyle, and The Apprentice. All started in 2005. Also, the first ever YouTube clip, which is this. Alright, so here we are on the uh, elephants. Um, the cool thing about these guys is that, is that they have really, really, really long um, trunks. And that's, that's cool. And that's pretty much all of us to say. <laughs> Top quality, first ever YouTube clip, there you go. Okay, 2006, International Year of Deserts and Desertification. Human Genome Project publishes its first chromosome sequence in nature. Former President of Barak, Saddam Hussein, is sentenced to death by hanging um, by the Iraqi Special Tribunal. Uh, death of Steve Irwin, right, it was that long ago. Australian environmentalist and television personality. Off split audiences, some loved him, some hated him, um, but he got nabbed by a stingray. Uh, International Astronomical Union defines planet as its 26th General Assembly, demoting Pluto to the status of dwarf planet, more than 70 years after its discovery. 27 to 2007, so we haven't got um, clips from, from Communicate. Also, I haven't, what I haven't done is the uh, titles of Communicate. So 2005 was turning conservation awareness into action. We were beginning to think at that stage, and this was actually to do with the origin of the Natural History Consortium as well, is what can we do in Bristol, these organisations joining together in and around Bristol, 
How can we work better together to actually achieve something rather than just nice day out at the zoo, blue chip programs on TV, etc., etc. Let's get together and do this. And so we titled that one, Turning Conservation Awareness into Action. We still weren't very clear on how to do it, though. 2006 um, was Understand, Engage and Inspire. Now, 2007 was called Going Mainstream. That's the title of Communicate in 2007. And that's because, well, anyone tell me what went mainstream and was, had been a peripheral issue and then went all over the place in 2007. What big issue did that? Homelessness. Say again? Homelessness. No. Nope. We're still talking about it. Climate change. It's climate change. Up to that point, there'd have been lots of campaigning, lots of information, lots of issues, but at that point, it suddenly became front page news, top stories on general media, on the front of Time magazine, etc. Places that it hadn't been before. So that's why we called 2007 going mainstream. We were kind of going, I remember the, the planning meetings for Communicate, going, okay, something's happened here. What made that go mainstream? Of course, what's the big mainstream thing at the moment? Everyone's talking about plastics, okay? So the other thing to think about is while we're doing this exercise is, what can we learn from all these things going on that has made Plastics come to the fore, and how do we deal with that? So, 2007, Gordon Brown becomes Prime Minister of a Labour majority government. Apple CEO Steve Jobs introduces the original iPhone, released on sale later that year. Smartphones came into existence in 2007. My daughter finds that incredible. I was talking to her on the way home last night after Communicate Plus, but she came to. She cannot imagine a world without smartphones. IPCC published its fourth assessment report, having concluded that global climate change is very likely to have a predominantly human cause. The 2007 European heat wave, in the aftermath of Greece's, Greece's worst heat wave in a century, at least 11 people are reported dead from heat stroke. Approximately 200 wildfires break out nationwide, and the country's electricity grid nearly collapses due to record breaking demand. Live Earth concerts are held in nine major cities around the world to raise environmental awareness. Awareness. And high speed one from London to the Channel Tunnel is open to passengers. Okay, 2008. This uh, conference this year was called Messages for Change. World population now up to 6.7 billion, and we've gone up from 48% to 50% of people living in cities. International Year of Planet Earth, International Year of the Potato. Stock markets around the world plunge amid growing fears of a U.S. recession fueled by the 2007 subprime mortgage crisis. So that's when the, so the, the crisis hit. Spotify Music, streaming services launched in Sweden. Barack Obama is elected 44th president of the U.S., becoming the first black president of the U.S. And the Large Hadron Collider is officially inaugurated in Geneva. And Catherine Simmons from Tesco came and spoke at Communicate. And we've, we've done an awful lot of work to cut our own carbon footprint. We measured our carbon footprint, we set targets, long term stretching targets out to 2020. We communicated those to our business, we communicated those to the press. And then we got to work. Um, this is where the kind of supplier part uh, gets pulled in. We have an environmental design tool. Every piece of kit that goes into our stores has been put through this tool. So, you know, we asked my brought us three chairs, we worked out what was in each of those chairs, what are the materials, what's it, its carbon content, how easy can it be. We cycled all those different things, we fed it through our little program. So suppliers now really understand that if they want to put something into a Tesco store, it's got to kind of meet those criteria. So this is kind of how we build our stores. Um, we have invested a lot of money in, in doing this work. We've got a 100 million pound fund that can only be spent on uh, uh, low carbon technologies like wind turbines, um, combined heat and power plants. Um, we've done a lot of work on energy efficiency. I think we spent 86 million pounds last year just switching to energy efficient kits, fridges, ovens, lighting. I've got an example here. Really, really simple, uh, you know, to sit down and think about what you do with the case lights. First thing is to switch them off at night. Even in, even in our 24 hour stores, no need for them to be all night. <coughs> switch them off, let's switch them to energy saving light bulbs, let's get the provision. So, um, the average house in the UK emits 5.8 tons of carbon a year. This single initiative saves 7,200 tons of CO2, which equals uh, over 1,000 houses. All the work we did last year on energy efficiency. Uh, 11 passengers. I mean, that's the largest. <laughs> they really are about 11,000 pounds on 
Um, okay then, so switching tack then, that was the top down, this was us setting our vision, um, you know, changing the way we do business, moving to a low carbon economy. How about you know, the flip side, where we can really have an impact on the business, how we can show our customers um, how to win the market. So how can we empower them to, to do their bit? Um, it's about 30 million people come through Tesco stores each week. Uh, we employ 450,000 people around the world. So, Real, really high numbers of people at Tesco can reach. I think um, you may agree, but I think when companies like supermarkets, especially big ones like Tesco, when, when we do something, it very quickly becomes normal. I mean, Tesco is doing something that is pretty, pretty standard stuff. I think that's a great power that we have, a big business that we are, that we can kind of come in and say, well, actually, this is, this is how people behave, and this is a normal behavior. So. Now remember, you should be working in this, jotting down your thoughts and ideas, okay? It can be just thoughts or reactions. And I mentioned that, and the reason we picked that out is because we had a very interesting reaction that year. And I remember being gobsmacked about it and talking to Catherine afterwards. Because um, she didn't realise what happened after she left. She just came and she did her talk. She couldn't stay for the whole day and off she went. And there was a seething mass of annoyance and anger. Do you remember it? In the audience. condescending. <laughs> well, now again, this may hit you in different ways. You decide your own response to this. Some people my own thoughts on this. Some people, I want to put words into people's mouths, but it was always, how dare a big multinational do all this good work? <laughs> I've been campaigning all this for years and now they're doing something that I've kind of lost my thing to campaign against. Some people in the audience, in my perception, felt threatened by something like this happening. Or was it happening? Was it all greenwash? Something about some of the people in the audience and their reaction to a big global brand like Tesco. What Catherine said is, what Tesco does is normal. This room is not full of normal people. We are by definition <laughs> self-selecting to come to a conference like this. Okay. So, anyway, thoughts about that. How would you have reacted to that at the time? She came back a few years later as well when she was working for Coca-Cola. <laughs> Think about our relationship as NGOs, as other communicators or whatever, with big multinationals. Good or bad, positive or negative, we support them, campaign against them. In what circumstances? Think about it. Okay, let's go on to 2009. Uh, valuing the invaluable, this is what we called Communicate that year. Outbreak of the H5N1 influenza strain, commonly referred to as swine flu, is in the global pandemic. Um, United Nations Climate Change Conference held in Copenhagen. James Cameron's Avatar has since been the highest grossing film of all time premieres in the, U in the UK. Closure of Woolworths, spelled an end to 100 years of the retail chain. Bank of England cut its base rate to 1.5% amid a global economic downturn. The lowest, is, lowest it had been in the bank's 300 year history, so that, that changed things a lot. Approval was granted for the building of the controversial third runway in the sixth terminal at Heathrow. Office for National Statistics announced that the UK's economy is officially in recession. Bank of England reduces the base rate to a half percent, its lowest ever level. And ITV announces that its news and information teletext service will be discontinued. So you've got smartphones invented in 2007, teletext bites the dust in 2009. Um, and we had Jonathan Porritt as a keynote speaker at Value of the Invaluable Conference. I'm only doing it point out that there is a depth of engagement, a quality of leadership that we very rarely hear from our politicians, from the most progressive business leaders in the world today, and I'm sorry to have to put it in these terms, from most NGOs. And for me, there's something very interesting going on here, that we've lost our nerve. We don't think somehow that we have license to engage with communities, with whole societies, at that much deeper level of what it is that provides meaning in people's lives, what it is that gives us that deeper sense of the dignity of humankind and our role in the world. And John Neal got two minutes, he's going to get three now. You go back, you read any of John Neal's work, you will find in every particular of that man's work a connectedness back into deep philosophical commitments that draw
drove him as an individual. Yes, he works hard as an activist to stop bad things happening and make good things happen, but every single bit of his working life was driven by this philosophical commitment. Well, I think we're a second bit from So I just want to open that up. If we're talking about quality of leadership, we've got to talk about depth of leadership, we've got to talk about the language we use. We've got to move away from some of these either-or dichotomies that actually, I think, make people ignore the nature of the challenge that we face. And that's, for me, a really, a really big issue now. So part of my challenge over the next few years is to think much more about that notion of quality. How do we do this positive, upbeat stuff? I really like the questions, how do we move into a more positive space? I mean, all the things that get people buzzing up until now, inconvenient truth, um, the age of stupid, end of the line. Uh, you had two people referenced there, the issue of acidification uh, in the oceans. There's an astonishing film called The Acid Test about um, acidification of the oceans, a US film. I'm sorry, Kevin, I haven't got a good web reference for it, but I'll find one. Um, all of these films, which are hugely powerful, they just are so difficult to deal with because they do leave us without support, as someone said here, ain't you stupid, <laughs> you need a little group afterwards to say, yep, that's bad, but hey, guess what? We're doing this, you know. You sort of need somebody to pick it up again. We have not got four in-your-face, brilliant stories about what living a sustainable, ethical, compassionate, authentic life would look like. We don't have that canon of work to call on. And my worry is, but until we've got that, a lot of people are going to go on saying, yeah, nice stuff, guys, but really, we don't quite know what this means. We can't relate to it. We can't empathize with this stuff. It doesn't really work. It's too far away. Someone said to me the other day, this kind of changes up. It just can't be called. If it was real, there'd be mass hysteria. It's <laughs> a really nice closed circle. Humans do what other humans do. Humans think what other people think. It's a great book by Mark Earls called Herd. Um, humans like a flock of starlings. No one's particularly in charge, we just can do what we do and justify afterwards why we did it. <laughs> but we don't not take an action because nobody else is. It's fine. It's not real. Anyway, uh, let's come to 2010, International Year of Biodiversity. What a great opportunity that was. Uh, and interestingly, it was interesting because there were there was a coming together, there was a, a branding, which lots of people got under, umbrella branding, um, which was to do with International Year of Biodiversity. Uh, and also Darwin 200, uh, BBC Breeding Places, all of those kind of things um, happened that year. Uh, also, a magnitude 7 earthquake in Haiti, devastating Port-au-Prince. Deepwater Horizon oil drilling platform exploded in the Gulf of Mexico, killing 11 workers. Uh, Eurozone agreed to bail out Greece. First 24 hour flight by a solar powered plane in solar impulse. WikiLeaks, an online publisher of anonymous covert and classified material, leaks to the public. Uh, another magnitude uh, 7 earthquake rocks Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, European Union agreed to an 85 billion round rescue deal for Ireland, who did a lot of <laughs> rescuing uh, in that year. Uh, 2010 United Nations Climate Change Conference held in Cancun, Mexico. Uh, um, Office of National Statistics said that the UK was no longer in recession. Cadbury taken over by Kraft in an 11.5 billion pound deal, and they renamed a lot of their promises. Um, 2010 general election took place, resulting in a hung parliament the formation of Conservative Liberal Coalition government. Harald Lucas, leader of the Green Party, became the party's first Westminster MP. Reavers bred in the wild in Scotland for the first time in 400 years. Quality of Act came into, uh, act came into effect, uh, consolidating legislation requiring equal treatment and access to employment and services regardless of gender, race, health, disability, sexual orientation, belief, and age. And George Osborne unveils the highest post-war cuts in public spending launching an age of austerity in 2010. Um, and we have a clip from Paul Evans talking about the problem with biodiversity in 2010.
here's a well-known poem which spoke so strongly about our feelings for nature, it became indelibly stamped on British culture. So much so, it now seems a bit passé, tired through overuse and less relevant. So let's translate it into Quangoese. I wandered lonely as a cloud. To assess landscape character and destination, benchmarking for a proactive approach to outdoor recreation, following principles of sustainable tourism, and to prevent the erosion of tranquility, as defined by CPRE's Tranquil Areas Survey and Regional Planning Guidance RPG 13, I went on my own. <laughs> that floats on high o'er vales and hills. My survey quadrants were within the SSSIA, ONB, and National Park, and according to the policy ER2, were of landscape character subtype 5A, ridge and valley. When all at once, I saw a crowd. Uh, an NVC, that's National Vegetation Classification Community, MG5, species-rich grassland, Carnosaurus cristatus, Centuria nigra, a host of golden daffodils, a seasonal dominance of Narcissus and Narcissus. Beside the lake, lakeside transition to reed swamp vegetation, NBC M13, but alkaline fen, therefore a sack, special area of conservation beneath the trees, ancient semi-natural woodland WD1 covered by a UK BAP biodiversity action plan, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, waving and flapping rapidly in persistently in an irregular manner, that magic, that's multi-agency geographic information for the country. Um, I kid you not. Uh, we'll also hear from Chris Baines, uh, talking about urban nature connections. And uh, it's certainly all the more important in the age we're in, in the density of population that we have, uh, in the kind of lifestyles that we lead. One person in a hundred lives in the British Isles. We are one of the most urbanised societies on earth. And you don't need me to tell you that anything that nature can do to counter the stresses of that kind of uh, very urban lifestyle has to be seen as hugely valuable. So we need nature as we've never needed it before. And how do we begin to engage people? How do we make the connections? Well, it's interesting obviously interesting in listening to Sir David this morning, but um, this presentation was put together three weeks ago, I suppose. There are kids climbing trees. I think the nostalgia uh, ticket is an absolutely uh, fundamental one. If I want to bring tears to the eyes of an evil planning officer somewhere who's about to wipe out a patch of woodland, if I can just get him or her to remember where they played at the age of six or seven, You've won, basically. That nostalgia ticket really is very powerful. So dandelion clocks, which aren't on anybody's endangered list species, very powerful in terms of communication, in terms of engaging people. And the more hard-nosed, the more detached from nature they are, in my experience, the more likely they are to be engaged through that kind of connection. There isn't um, an aggressive business leader in the country, I suspect, that didn't climb trees at the age of four or five. Uh, and it's interesting that, uh, in fact, the, the Director General of the CBI three or four years ago, Dickie Jones, was making exactly this point. He was talking about it being really important to have that element in childhood because that's about managing risk. And if you don't have risk management at the age of five or six, where are the entrepreneurs going to come from at the age of 30 or 40? So there is a really powerful connection, I think, between these very simple uh, nostalgic connections to, to nature and the influential, the powerful people that we need to reach. Okay, on to 2011, a uh, communicate was called Nature, People and Economics. Um, IUCN Red List contains over 20,000 species listed for extinction. I forgot to mention before at the beginning of the communicate, it was about 15,000. Uh, world population crosses over 7 billion, and now 52% of people live in cities. Uh, Osama bin Laden uh, was killed, the United Nations declares famine in southern Somalia, Occupy Wall Street protests begin in the US. Uh, Prince William, Duke of Cambridge and Catherine Middleton married. The UK population rose uh, by half a million between 2009 and 2010. 
And Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, the final installment of the Harry Potter film series, was released in UK cinemas and London rioted. I don't know if that's because um, <laughs> more Harry Potter than they would have been <laughs> um, And in that same year, 2011, we heard from uh, Graham Russell uh, in a presentation entitled A Persuasive Approach. <coughs> stuff and look at the psychology of who you're going to influence and all the rest of it. Who segments the market or do you just see it in a big block of people that you're going to influence? Who does market segmentation? That's not bad, that's pretty good. Uh, it's only less than 50%. So this is a slide for the, uh, everybody, but the particularly those that didn't put your hand up. And when you're trying to get to people, it's not just one blob of people. You know, they're not all Mr. and Mrs. Bloggers out there. I'm not going to read this to you, but it goes at the top on positive green, so to get them to do the next thing is relatively straightforward to stall starters, honestly disengaged, and waste watchers. Read it for yourself, and it means anybody in here, and it's good that 50% are doing it, if you just see people as one set of people, then you're not going to get them all to move. That's about all the audience segmentation. <coughs> and Catherine Simmons, previously of uh, Tesco, came back, now at a new job at Coca-Cola. Hello, Matt. Subspecies died in Galapagos. 
Uh, CERN announced his discovery of a new particle, the Higgs boson. Of course, we had the 2012 Summer Olympics, which the Conservative government has said has been the greenest Olympics ever. Uh, Barack Obama is re-elected in the, in the US. Uh, it's the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. 28 people, including the gunman, are killed in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. Uh, O2 announces plans to provide free internet to millions of residents and visitors in central London by U launching Europe's largest free Wi-Fi zone. Uh, the UK government debt has risen over one with lots of zeros after it for the first time. I'm not even think what that is. It's probably a trillion. So anyway. <coughs> Ash Dieback fungus first found in the British Isles in 2012. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II celebrates her diamond jubilee. Boris Johnson re-elected as mayor of London. Um, uh, a man is killed. Torrential rain causes widespread, widespread flooding. I can't even say it. Widespread flooding across England. And storms also force the Olympic torch relay to be halted briefly. The Shard, the tallest building in Europe and the tallest habitable freestanding structure in the UK, is officially opened. Bradley Wiggins won the Tour de France. And Lord Leveson announced the findings of the Leveson Inquiry. And from this year, we have Rob Hoskins talking about the next 10 years for people and nature. With us in the places where we live, rolling up our sleeves, bringing people together, and working out what we do. So, transition has really been that experiment that asks that question of people. So, here we are living in this extraordinary time. Uh, what are we going to do about it? The industrial and agricultural revolution took thousands of years. The agricultural revolution took hundreds of years. This needs to take about 20 years. If we do this, it'll be this thing that our children and grandchildren will tell great tales about and sing great songs about. So just as a, as, as a, as a quick overview of what transition is, I think one of the things that it does very interestingly is it's kind of a, a quite an interesting model of how it spreads. And the best analogy, which is in a room where I don't have to go explain it too much as a lot of you are involved in nature conservation, <laughs> is it's like a micro fungus that you inoculate a place with, you inoculate a community with, and it runs in this incredibly fine web of relationships and connections. And it will fruit in some places where you expect, and it will also fruit in other places where you don't expect. Often when you go and look to see what's going on, you can't see because a lot of it is running underneath the surface. But it's a really fascinating, the idea of actually what we need to do is not about environmental change in the conventional sense. Actually, I increasingly see transition as being about cultural change, is how do you inoculate the culture of a place so that this process runs and things start to happen. A few of the ways by which it spreads, it spreads by creativity. This is in Tooting in London. These are Bertie and Gertie, who are ducks made from old plastic bags for something called the Trash Catchers Carnival that Transition Town Tooting organised. Thousands of people came out, made a huge street carnival. 10,000 people came out to see it. Uh, an incredible community celebration. But at the end of it, people thought, if we can do this, we can do anything. It's a very, very powerful thing to leave behind. People coming together, doing stuff together practically. This is on Kilburn Underground Station. Transition Kensal to Kilburn uh, have created the first edible garden on the London Underground Station. You can hop off the train, pick some salad on your way home. Ideas that you can cut and paste. So this is uh, in London, one of the transition groups, Bell Size, I think it was, started this idea called Draft Busters. There was money from the council for draft proofing windows and doors in old Victorian buildings. No one was really taking up, them up on it because it was kind of quite boring, really. So the transition group start doing the same way as like a Tupperware party, you meet in someone's house, you draft proof it, you get sent home with enough stuff to do your own house. The beauty of something like transition is when an idea like that works, the next transition group starts doing it, and then the next one, and then the next one. There are now about 50 transition groups in London, most of them are draft busters. Draft busters is spreading around all over the place because these groups are like small research and development units. And we had Stephen Moss who talked to us a little bit about uh, nature deficit disorder Like all of you who are over about 45, and I think the lucky ones of you who are under 45 but by some miracle slip through the net of, of repression, I was a free-range child. When I was a child, the word cotton wool kids had not been invented. There was no need for it. I came from a housing estate on the edge of London. My mother was a single parent. Uh, my mother and grandmother who brought me up were, were almost... Um, indecently over careful for those days, now they would probably have the social workers round. Because of course from the age of seven or eight they let me up. This is what we did. And when I think about today's generation, I get sad 
And then I get very angry, and then I get very, very determined to do something about it. And um, the fact that he's very jittery there, he wasn't actually doing that. It's just something about the video, you couldn't get that kind of display at normal speed. Look about playing at normal speed, actually. When you watch YouTube live, I only found this yesterday, you can actually watch it faster um, than the real speed. If you watch it about one and a quarter speed, it looks almost like you're watching at normal speed. You can watch it at one and a half speed as well. So you can actually cram more reality in your life than you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's move to 2013. Uh, Andy Murray won the men's singles at Wimbledon. Um, there's a few things here I'm going to miss out a lot of them. Uh, reported that sewage workers from the Thames Water have removed a 15 ton bus sized fatberg from the sewers beneath London. That's very important. Um, but even more important, same sex marriage becomes legal in England and Wales after the Marriage Same Sex Couples Act receives royal assent. Um, and on that basis, we had Ben Summerscourt, um, uh, CEO of Stonewall at that meeting, and basically the reason for getting Ben uh, along was basically we thought, okay, how can you get so much change in that area when we're failing to get that much change when we're talking about nature and biodiversity and the environment? So Ben Summerskill came along again to see a 2013 keynote, um, and this is a clip from that. Bite in the cold, <laughs> just like everyone else's marriage. <laughs> And the importance of that is it gives people emotional pull. And then I would say, and this is more delicate territory, let's look at what's happened around human rights in this country. We've had a campaign to introduce the Human Rights Act. In 1999, we got a Human Rights Act. Fifteen years later, one of our major parties of government, and we think it is highly possible, they're not likely that the Conservatives will be government, one of our major parties of government is going into a general election committed to repealing the Human Rights Act. And I only observe that possibly the people who campaigned for that did not develop sufficient narrative, did not talk to enough people to persuade them it was important. And I will always remember, very shortly after I started at Stonewall, reflect on this, it's not a criticism, it's an observation, but I always remember, you know, quite a well-known human rights campaigner, and I met her one evening, she was very excited, and she said, I've just been at a meeting, there were 150 people there, every single person stood up and applauded, they all agreed with me. And I couldn't help thinking, shall we? <laughs> Um, I couldn't help thinking, if you're an advocate and you're arguing for something controversial and you're in a room where 150 people are on their feet applauding you, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> and that is something we have to think about when we're campaigning all the time. That's one of the most quoted things that I've ever heard actually from communicate is Ben saying, if you're in a room and everyone's agreeing with you, you're in the wrong room. The other thing he said, um, from my memory, is before he came to the conference, he looked at lots of our websites and he said, I don't know what you want me to do. There's obviously a crisis, you're all saying, do something. But I don't know what you want me to do. There's loads of conflicting messages. That's another thing that came out from Ben's talk, which is very powerful. Also that year we had uh, Matt Walpole. Um, Well, the other thing to mention that, and here's another example from Brazil, is that through uh, the democratization of information, through the sharing of information on climate change, we're actually seeing really positive action. And this is a story from the Amazon which shows that over the course of less than a decade, uh, in recent years, we've seen a massive, massive decline in rates of deforestation. Now, why is that? It has a number of factors, of course. But one of the things that's happened in this period is that we've become far better at near real-time monitoring for forest change through satellite information that is now being put out in Brazil in near real-time uh, for public availability and consumption and which is being used alongside law enforcement efforts to really hit home where the deforestation is taking place. And as part of an effort to effect change, having this very clear, unambiguous data on change and rates of change, and finally, 
I talk very quickly through some of the data we have. There's massive advantage, but are we using that effectively? Do we have the right kind of data? The UK is, is, is data rich, but it's also, and the UK international ecosystem is a good example of this, relies still very much on expert opinion. Now, whether that is the expert sitting in their ivory tower, or whether it is the expert farming their fields, there's a lot of knowledge that doesn't always get translated into statistics and facts and graphs. How do we draw that into the decision making process? This is the big topic of discussion right now. Equally, how do we improve the flow of the right kind of information from those places which are currently very information scarce? There's a little amount you can do with satellites, there's a amount you can do by getting out there on the ground. Citizen science here is a particularly big issue. A lot of the data we have in the UK is volunteer driven. It's people going out there looking at what's happening and telling other people about it and bringing it together. It's not all done by science. And we see the same transition elsewhere in the world. And in particular here, if we want to get better decisions, we've got to think about the decision makers we're aiming this at. We're very good uh, in the biodiversity sector at talking to ourselves. We're very good at talking to the environment ministries, but are we yet really talking to the development ministries, the finance ministries, the treasury? Those parts of government that really have the impact on practice. Mm -hmm. We've got to be able to use this information to convince them that there are ways they can change, and ways that we can build biodiversity. So data, availability of data, very important. And lastly for that year, uh, Simon Christmas, who came and reported about, um, that there was a white paper um, uh, looking at um, the, I'll start again, this is <laughs> the white paper. By 2020, significantly more people will be engaged with biodiversity issues, aware of its value, and taking positive action. So his research was all about, is that happening? Five years. As I mentioned, the first break that we made was between unaware, as we economic it, and aware. And in that model, we get our first tier, that's 30% who were aware, who, when they were asked what they thought was happening to the variety of living things, they were the same. <laughs> and are all going up in the UK and the world. And also, uh, I thought that would be the case in the future as well. The next break we made was around an issue we talked about concern. So you can look at the question, but it was about for those people who did think there was some kind of decline, is that something you care about? Is that something worth doing something about? And uh, the second tier is the 17% of people who um, were concerned, but that's a sort of concern for you. All of these numbers are in the short report that you can get down, and there's a lot more detail about it, so hopefully you can still get stuff down now. Uh, finally, the dimension that we used was one around action, that's our remaining tiers. So we looked at, we asked lots of questions about what people purported to do in the category reports, which we and looked at that kind of question of action. Lots of discussion in terms of which actions we answered that. 25% of the people who said they were aware of the issues and expressed concern but didn't really show any evidence of doing anything, that's our famous value action gap. So that's our 25% uh, in tier three. And I'm not going to go into lots of details, but what we did with the remaining group is we separated out two tiers. Um, tier 4 is doing some stuff, and Tier 5 is doing a lot, really. I imagine many of the people in this room are Tier 5, so uh, that would put you in 10% of the population. Work from that group, uh, but you're not necessarily very typical. <coughs> um, how does this help us? How does it help us? Well, firstly, it gives us, uh, we're going to start by having a, a strategy target. Well, Gives us some kind of sense of well, what might we use as indicators, what are we actually following? It's not perfect, but better than what we had before, and at least clearly leads to the, to the engagement even more. It's linked to the actual thing we're talking about. I think it also helps to start thinking about um, priorities and setting priorities. Uh, for example, in the uh, report, we suggest, in my view, we well, to challenge it, but we suggest that uh, tier two is probably not a very good target actually. Quite difficult, probably, for people who um, are aware of these issues. But they start getting to say, "Well, look, 30 percent of people that we can go for who aren't, who seem to be currently not even aware of the issue. That seems like it might be an easier task. So, with only a few years left, 2020 might not go for that. Similarly, on action. Well, if we if we make out, if we pretend that our task is to get everyone into that tier five, we're doing lots of stuff, high effort behaviours, probably unrealistic. And do we really want to be doing that? Is there an opportunity to think about moving some of those people in tier three just into tier four a bit? 
we can start having some of these kinds of conversations. I should note just two cautions. Um, this is not uh, some kind of customer journey. I'm not suggesting, they've got numbers, perhaps to refer to them somewhere, but I'm not saying you can go through this sequentially. For instance, if you go and find someone who's in tier one, have a chat with them about the issues, tell the right stories, get them engaged, maybe they'll jump straight into tier four or tier five. That could be kind of work. The second thing is despite appearances, and I know that people will be coming and asking about this later, this is not segmentation. <coughs> segmentation should give you explanatory power. It should tell you something about the people in these different, in the groups that it talks talk about. So how those things, how it's engaged and what to do. This is purely descriptive. It's a snapshot of where we are in terms of engagement. Okay, right. Wrong thing to do in the last bit. There's uh, just two more clips, uh, and the rest is just off here. We're coming up to more recent times now, so you're kind of probably uh, not so surprised about what's happening in the last four years. Uh, but 2014 was the UK's warmest year since records began, and also new car sales reached a 10-year high of nearly two, two and a half million. Um, what else have we got here? International Panel on Climate Change releases the final part of its fifth impact assessment report warning that the world faces severe, pervasive and irreversible damage from global emissions of CO2. Uh, figures by the Met Office indicate southern England and parts of the Midlands have experienced the highest January rainfall since records began. Uh, the announcement comes as military personnel prepare to help residents in flooded areas of Somerset. Um, after visiting some of the country's flooded areas, David Cameron says that money is no object. Uh, 4.1 magnitude earthquake is recorded under the Bristol Channel. Uh, and oh, let's not worry about all the rest of those bits here. Also in 2014, um, so our title for the Communicate Language was Understanding Audiences and, and Beyond the Bubble. Uh, and we had Ben, uh, sorry, George Marshall came along and said lots of work on, on uh, climate change communication. And he gave us a keynote, and there's two clips from that. That's our last two clips to look at. So, George Marshall from 2014. Stories, we're here to talk about stories. Stories are fascinating. This is, this is a very interesting experiment back from 1944. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. Fritz Heider and Marion Sybil did this rather fascinating animation. You can watch this on YouTube. And they asked people to describe what was happening. Have a look at it and see if you can work out how would you describe what's happening in this? And of course, what happens is that people do not say, well, there seems to be a bunch of rectangles over there, a circle, and a couple of triangles moving randomly around the, around the screen. They say, well, the, that, that's the bully, and that's beating up on that one, and that, that's, that's, the, that's the husband who's trying to steal the wife. And they come up with these extraordinary stories. I, I showed this to my son. My son was 10 years old. He said, well, that's the bully. That's a bully, that's a teacher coming to try and stop them. Everybody who sees this thing, why well, wouldn't you do the same thing? Projects onto it their own values, their own ideas, their own life experience, but with the utter compulsion, just from shapes moving around on a screen, to be able to create a story out of it. For me, I have a background in the direct action movement, and it's clear this is not this occupation. There's <laughs> <laughs> the security guard moving out. What's interesting about these stories is not just that they're drawn from people's values, people's experience, but also they very often are drawn around stories of conflict. So just with something as random as this, we're getting a sense of what are the key components of what creates compelling stories for people. There's an irony to that. This is how complex climate change communication is. These various narratives and ways of talking are in constant competition. And we see this competition everywhere. I'm fascinated by this. <coughs> you can just read this yourself. This is from the Guardian website. Everywhere we go in society, we need to remember that for every climate change narrative has a context. And that context is everything else that's appearing around it. And there's a conversation which is happening between, between these different parts. So that any language or any story that we have is not just about the story we tell. It is about the context of the stories that surround it. Is that the last one? Thank you. Um, okay, so let's go briefly. 2015, uh, Communicate was titled Challenging Partnerships. We had some interesting talks um, from, about RSP we're working with Barrett Homes. 
So being very practical, actually thinking about the wildlife implications and being able to add you know, wildlife friendly features into to homes as Barrett homes are building, etc. Uh, 2015 UK general election results in the first Conservative majority government for 18 years. Hurricane Patricia becomes the most intense hurricane ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere. Um, 2015 United Nations Climate Change Conference held in Paris attended by leaders from 147 nations. Um, Helen MacDonald wins the 2014 Costa Book Awards for her autobiography Ages for Hawk. Uh, and TV presenter Jeremy Clarkson is suspended from Top Gear. Um, what else have we got? Uh, nationwide poll to find a national bird for the UK has chosen the robin as the public's favourite candidate. Uh, 250,000 people take to the streets in cities such as London, Bristol and Manchester in a demonstration backed by the People's Assembly Against Austerity. UK population grew by almost half a million to reach 64.5 uh, million. Jeremy Corbyn elected as the leader of the Labour Party. Um, and England becomes the last country in the UK to in in introduce a mandatory 5P charge on plastic carrier bags. 2016, swapping spectacles is what we call it that year. Uh, UK votes in a referendum to leave the EU. Still going on that one. Uh, final video cassette recorder is manufactured by a Japanese company, <laughs> Funai. Uh, global CO2 levels exceed 400 ppm at the time of year normally associated with minimum levels and it's believed to be higher than anything experienced in human history. Uh, 150 nations meet at the UN Environment Programme Summit in Rwanda and agree to phase out HFCs in an amendment to the Montreal Protocol. And Donald Trump is elected 45th President of the US. 2017, we called it Changing Minds. Uh, sorry, we had Changing Minds, tool from, tools, uh, tools from Behavioural Science. Uh, International Year of Sustainable Tourism, a terror attack in Westminster kills five. Uh, Islamist terrorist attack on London Bridge kills eight. Uh, Paris Climate Agreement uh, happened. Hurricane Harvey strikes the US. Um, new species of orangutan is identified in Indonesia, becoming the third known species of orang. 2018, changing minds beyond plastics. Um, this is the thing that we held earlier this year, and this was trying to do a little bit of what we're doing now, is actually going, how did we get to the point of plastics being such a big thing? How is it now that it's too big for <coughs> the um, And one of the presentations there is by Chris Rose, who has been an environmental campaign for a very long time. He presented uh, a presentation which included these slides. So this is going to kind of finish us off really. I'm not going to go through this, but there's just a couple of things, certainly his whole presentation, but a couple of things that we found fascinating from this. Some work by Daniel Kahneman and others, um, talk about system one and system two thinking, okay? Most of what we do every day, 95% of it is basically habit, and you don't think about it, okay? Getting up in the morning, brushing your teeth, you do it every, every day. Most of the things we do is based on habit and social pressure, but mostly habit. <coughs> System two is I need to stop and think and analyze something a bit slower, okay? Now system one, system two thinking, okay? So you're fast, his book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, okay? So most of your, your daily life is basically <coughs> automatic. I'll come back to that in a second. This is another thing as well, actually he's talking about framing ocean plastics. Is it litter or is it pollution? Litter is something you can go and pick up and do something about. Pollution is something which is a bigger issue. It's easier to act on one than another. One is your problem, you can go and pick it up and solve it. You dropped it, you pick it up. Pollution, microplastics, far more insidious, takes greater societal change to address. So if we actually think about framing <coughs> plastics, or plastic waste, is it waste, is it litter, is it pollution? Actually that has a big influence on what we do about it. System one and system two is very important because basically what you're saying is actually we've been talking about plastics in the ocean for a very long time. Mostly, it's in scientific publications. Mostly, it doesn't catch the imagination. The data is there, the information is there, but it doesn't come up into system two, sorry, into, into your fast, into track one thinking, into actually everyday conversation, chats down the pub, things which is top of mind. Until, well, this is where Tor Heyerdahl is actually going around uh, doing a, 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 a round the world voyage, and actually looking for lobs of oil, and he begins to see plastic. And because it's a kind of, it's an adventure, he's out there, he's catching public imagination, 
And because he talked about plastics a bit as well, it popped up into common discourse, but then it disappeared again. Came back up uh, with Charles Moore, again, an ocean exploration. It becomes a story. And then loads of other things beginning to be talked about, and of course culminating with Blue Planet 2. What this is trying to say is, it wasn't Blue Planet 2 what done it. This has been going on for a long time, but it's taken a lot of time and a lot of thought and some chance stuff to get this from being a scientific discourse into actually everybody's talking about it. Now maybe there's some things what we've just gone through for the last even 15 years communicating in the context of the world where we can go, right, what is it that gets the big issues that we want to talk about up into this fast track one thinking where it's part of everyday discussion with everyday normal people, not us. Everyday normal people who go to Tesco's and drink Coca-Cola. That it becomes a national discussion. What are those things that get something to the point where it's too big to ignore? <coughs> Hence the title of this session. Okay? And other points will make this available so you can see the rest of it. So that when people are doing, you know, when you're looking on Google at the search terms for plastic pollution, you kind of go, yeah, nobody, 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 nobody. Whoop, lots and lots of people are searching for plastic pollution. It becomes a thing that is in public discourse. So, thank you for bearing with us for going through the last 15 years of the world. Hopefully, you've been doing what I asked you to do, in writing down your thoughts as you've gone along. It may be thoughts where you go, ah, oh, that's really important. It may be something that communicates where you were at, and you go, actually, we didn't pick that out. So, bring that out as well. A thought, a feeling, something you've learned elsewhere, an example of something where you go, actually, yeah, that really worked, or it didn't really work. Because for the last half hour of this session, it's basically now over to you and your tables. That's the stimulus. Now, what we want you to do is basically discuss, talk, challenge each other, and see if you can come up with, individually, so you can have, you know, if you disagree with your table, that's okay. If you agree on three, all of you around the table, fine. If you disagree, then write your three down. So at the end of this, each individual in this room should have three things that they think are really, really important that we should bear in mind or do or think about when we're now planning what we're going to do for the next 15 years and beyond. To bring things that are important up until they become too big to ignore in the general public discourse. Okay? So... And just to remind you what we're going to then do with those is we'll take everyone's three top points, wheel set at some point and cluster them, and then they will reappear in those clusters on those boards at the back, which then you lot in this room and anyone who wasn't in this room can begin to look about and comment on and add to, and we'll end up basically with a big crowdsourced mind map with the most important things so that we can then compile that in some usable form and send it out to the one. This is the collective thoughts of this room as to how we do stuff to make it A, too big to ignore, and B, to give people something they can do about it when it is too big to ignore. Optimism, positivity, stuff we can do, etc. Is that okay? Is that kind of clearish? And I'm going to shut up now.